Hello, everyone, dear teachers. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Katia Valle, Schools and Exams Marketing Manager, talking to you from our office at Cambridge, Brazil, in Sao Paulo. I would like to know where you are joining from. Would you mind sending us this information in the chat? Hello, Argentina. Hello, Guayaquil. Brasilia, present. Wonderful. Lima, Peru. Uruguay. Wonderful. We are very glad you are here with us today. This week, we have been delivering a series of webinars. So we still have on Friday, a webinar on the adults sector, don't miss it. Uh, if we move the slides, please, you will see two QR codes. The one on the left, you have access to our Cambridge Brazil YouTube channel, where you can find all the recordings of our webinars. And on the right, let, let's show them, yes, the second QR code, you have uh, access to our future webinars and the registration page. Please follow us on social media. We've been communicating all these webinars. Uh, we are finishing the September webinars this week, but we are going to have another series in October. So please stay tuned. Follow us on social media at Cambridge Brazil. Before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. We will have time to deal with questions. We, uh, we kindly ask you to send them in the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. By the end of this presentation in the chat, we will place a link for feedback. And from this feedback form, you will get access to download your certificate for this presentation. As I told you, the webinars have been recorded and this one is going to be recorded too. And we will upload the recording in our Cambridge Brazil YouTube channel. Today, we have the honor and the privilege of having Herbert, Herbert Purta with us, who holds a PhD in ELT pedagogy, was a professor of English at the Teacher Training University in Graz, Austria. He is a really well known plenary speaker at numerous international conferences, and his course books include Super Safari, Super Minds, Think, and Empower, all published by Cambridge. Hello, Herbert. It's so good to have you here with us today. Hello, Katia. Great to be with you and thank you for your kind words. Thanks very much for accepting our invitation and I hand over to you. Have a good presentation. Thank you so much and um, good afternoon to everybody, which was a nice, it was a nice reminder that in your chat box, you said uh, it's a sunny afternoon where, where you are, at least in some of the countries where, where you're joining us from. I'm here in um, Austria in my study. When I look out um, through the windows, it's actually pitch dark out there. So it's eight o'clock uh, in the evening. And although we are having a, a beautiful European autumn actually, um, with beautiful um, colors and the leaves starting to turn uh, yellow, brown, and and golden and and red, uh, the nights are already um, pretty uh, cold. So welcome and thank you very much for joining us um, this um, afternoon. Uh, where I'm going to be talking about uh, the teaching of writing to young. Uh, learners. Uh, let's just have a look at the uh, table of contents. This is what I'm going to um, cover in this session. We need to talk, I think, about when we should actually start uh, to teach writing to children. Um, and, and writing is actually, as we know, requires 
uh, a number of um, rather demanding skills. So it's um, conglomerates of skills, skills sets that learners need to develop in order to be able to to learn writing uh, successfully. So this is what what we're going to uh, be talking about here. Uh, I'll be talking about basic capabilities and how we can develop them through reading. Reading, of course, plays a very, very important role in uh, developing uh, writing skills. And then when we've developed the basic capabilities, uh, we need to uh, help students acquire um, proper writing skills. And this includes, of course, uh, genre uh, writing. This includes helping them to improve their writing, uh, to work on their um, uh, styles already uh, at at um, a young age, and so on and so uh, forth. Writing is a challenging, or can be um, a challenging, or teaching to write can be a challenging process um, these days, especially with um, many young learners using um, digital devices these days. I mean, um, uh, iPads and, and, and screens and uh, iPads and other tablets and, and screens uh, can be seen in the hands of many young children. When I travel and I go to restaurants, I'm often surprised how how parents. I saw a couple with with two delightful young girls recently. One of them may be four years old or even three. The other one six or seven, and they were totally focused. Unfortunately on the tablets in front of them. And this is something um, that um, parents sometimes do because they think, well, this is how I can keep my child busy and and, and quiet. Um, but it's also as educators, I think we need to be a little bit worried about that because we know for sure that when it comes to the development of things like um, attention span and focus, uh, being exposed to screens for too long is not something that is actually very helpful. So it can be quite difficult to develop um, uh, reading and also in particular uh, writing skills these days. And um, so we, I think we really need to um, care about how we can, we can actually uh, do this. Well, this young man obviously is finding a bit it a bit difficult to to <laughs> start <laughs> writing i like the the picture uh, nevertheless um what i would like you to do now just to start this this um webinar off and i would like to hear a little bit from you uh, a little bit more than what you have already kindly shared so far it's lovely to see uh, where are you from, all the countries and the, the cities where you're joining us from. But I'd also like to to um, get your thinking going a little bit about um, what uh, writing or learning to write and learning to read was like for you when um, you started um, with those skills. I mean, I'm uh, most definitely the oldest participant in this uh, webinar, but I can remember very, very well what it was like to to uh, learn to read and to write. I I I can remember the the first few books I read. I I I can remember what it actually meant to me. I can remember writing the first few few texts actually and what that meant for me as a as a child so here's a question for you i'm asking you to take uh, a minute or maybe a bit less uh, than a minute and remember the days when you 
actually learned to read and write. And and I would like you to um, focus on the the memories, the thoughts, the feelings um, that um, this brings back to you. Okay, so. Can you just maybe write a few words or a few sentences um, that somehow let us take part in what was going on in your minds? Um, you, I, I need to actually slow this down a little. You have done this very fast. I love reading, but I have no imagination for writing, Susanna says. Anxiety, um, Katharina. How how sad I would like to say I hope that anxiety has has somehow uh, been mended in the meantime. Pamela says I was stressed out because English isn't similar to Spanish, of course, and much more difficult uh, when it comes to spelling, isn't it? Um, reading labels everywhere. Okay, I remember uh, Katya says my pre-primary teacher notebook. The training exercises with letters, I liked it, mainly because I liked and trusted my teacher. Wonderful. Thank you, Katya. So important. Um, it opened up a whole new world for me, Julia. Um, I, I would very much, um, that that very much chimes with, with me. It did open up a, a completely new world for me, too. I don't remember, Christina. Romina says, imagination comes to mind. Um, Gabriela, I loved writing, found a new way to express myself. Um, uh, wonderful. I'm very creative, but I don't like reading. It was, uh, hang on, I have skipped. It was difficult for me in the beginning, but my teacher encouraged us a lot. Lovely, Larissa. Thank you. Uh, that is, of course, a, a reminder of how important we all, you all are to your young, your young learners because you can be the one who encourages them when they are a bit uh, frustrated. I remember I thought it was so difficult because I didn't know how to start writing nor decide what I wanted to communicate. Beatrice, right. That's a, a key point also that... Um, uh, although our learners may be, may be very young, uh, we need to help them how to start and also need to, to help them to reflect on what it is they want to, to communicate. I used to be kind of frustrated because I couldn't write as fast as I wanted. That's, that's interesting, uh, Dilcia. And then there is Walter saying, hang on, um, I felt confident, very confident, and thought everybody uh, could write. I was seven, lovely. I was actually six when I started to, to read and write. Um, I remember that I didn't find a huge it find it huge, hugely difficult to learn these skills of reading and writing. My teachers were awesome, and my parents used to inspire me a lot. But as you said, I think that the lack of screens used to be better in our development in this part, okay? So, of course, obviously, um, I think most of us, when we grew up, we were not surrounded by uh, as many kids, uh, as many screens as kids um, are today. Uh, Maria Florencia, uh, reading was so difficult and slow that I thought adults had another secret way to do it. They did it so quickly. Lovely, lovely. Thank you. My parents were the crux of my learning how to write and read. Lovely. Uh, I felt confident, very confident. Ah, sorry, we were there already. Um, I, I've learned to read with my brother when I started school. I was bored. Oh, yes, this would have demanded a bit of differentiation, wouldn't it? Um, reading, I loved writing, frustrating motor skills issues. Not quite sure what this means, um, uh, career, but I hope we, we can clarify that. I felt happy and motivated being aware how many words I could read and understand. Beautiful. So this actually is all about uh, noticing one's own progress, isn't it? I remember it was challenging at first, but when I got the hang of it, I felt as though I was free. Lovely, Joao. Thank you. Um, this this 
um, expression of of who we are and and the freedom that we can feel when we can write. Uh, this, of course, goes um, along very nicely with uh, what Paulo Freire also said um, in his writing. I've always loved reading. I really enjoyed structured writing, but I struggled with creative writing. Okay, that's a, a, a very different in 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 some ways. They they are different subskills, aren't they? Um, creative and, and structured writing. Writing was difficult at first because of my handwriting, which was horrible. <laughs> I, I can side um, with that. I think I was always the only one who was able to read my handwriting. It hasn't changed much. Um, uh, Katerina, my teacher, used to inspire me and help me with writing skills. And that made the process much easier. Yes, that's that's lovely. Thank you. I just remember it was amazing. I learned by pieces and mechanically with a handbook, um, Katilia. But it was it has worked. Each advanced. I was surprised and happy to understand letters. So I I I I, I think um, I I know what you mean. So. Um, the, noticing one's own progress and advancement. That's that's something that is wonderful when it happens. I don't think students' need, needs were not taken in consideration at my times. Curiosity was not an important matter. Okay. When I said I was seven when starting writing, I mean English is a second language. Wow. I was 10 when I when I started with that. My my mother tongue is is German. So Walter, I guess you're much younger than I am. Writing in my mother tongue started when I was five. Okay, perfect. I was I was six. I think the most difficult was to think in the new language I was learning, to organize ideas, to check coherence and spelling. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much for for sharing all that. Um, I, I it's in it's interesting. What I remember now after reading that is. On the one hand of the spectrum, um, reading, learning to read and write, in particular, can be stressful. It can it, that can have to do with being slow, taking time, with not always uh, being able to spell correctly, especially when you have Spanish as a mother tongue, where where spelling is so much easier than than in English. Um, and on the other um, at the other pole of this spectrum, there's this this feeling of um, accessing a, a completely new and inspiring world, uh, feeling free because we we can write. Uh, and I guess in our classrooms, we will actually meet um, you know, similar kinds of experiences and thoughts. And feelings, and it's very important to actually acknowledge them and to try to um, feel empathy with our students and support the ones that need a lot of support so they don't get frustrated. And on the other hand, um, um, uh, inspire others um, to also write creatively, not just write in a structured way, and and um, help them as much as as uh, we can. Um, the question is, when should we start with with writing? Actually, and um, there are different patterns depending on where you go. I've been to countries where, sadly, I must say. Um, young learners um, were um, asked to copy and trace words at a very early age, three or four years old, at a time when they were not able to, to read even in their own language. Okay, it's not, it's not one of the countries present here. Uh, but I have seen this at least, I, I think, actually in two or three countries. So we need to, we don't want to wait for too long. There's a nice uh, quotation here from, from uh, Lee Martinez, who says, those who write are writers and those who wait are waiters, which um, should not denounce people who are waiters, obviously. 
But if we want to learn or if we want to teach our young learners to learn how to write, we need to, of course, um, start relatively early, but not uh, too early. So points to consider for the classroom are definitely the learner's age, the level of their reading and writing capabilities in, uh, in their own language, the intensity of the ELT program. Of course, when somebody is six years old, you have a class and you teach a group of six-year-olds. And if you only, say, had them for one hour or for even less, I've been to countries where uh, they get taught 30 minutes a week, of course, then the focus will not be on writing. And maybe you will spend the whole year teaching them as much as you can in in um, listening and and speaking, but you'll probably do very very little writing. Um, a, a point to consider is the children's exposure to English, and actually their level that, that these two points go hand in hand. Their level of comprehension. Um, there is a general agreement these days that children should actually have a good level of comprehension before they start to um, read and to write. We wouldn't start with reading before uh, or writing even before they uh, learn to, to understand um, uh, uh, oral language. Uh, and this is something uh, that Annemarie Pinter also, I think, would agree with. Um, she says... Uh, it would be controversial to introduce reading and writing in a second language to children who are not yet literate in their first language. However, once literacy in one language is established, children often expect to learn to read in the new language too. And I would like to add that many children are actually very keen on also learning how to write if the teaching of writing is actually done um, um, in the right way. So if the methodology of the teaching in writing inspires the child to, to learn to write and um, um, gives them an idea of uh, meaningful writing and not just writing as a mechanical um, skill with within inverted commas, okay? We need to teach writing as a proper communicative skill and not just as a, a, a mechanical um, uh, skill. Um, somebody has added in the meantime, Delia, that um, she had to uh, learn a lot of, of, of these two skills by herself because it was difficult for her uh, because of uh, dyslexia. And that's something that we come across, of course, a lot also um, in our classes, or maybe not a lot, but but it's definitely something that I, I guess um, we've all come um, um, across. So um, this is a key point that, and I mentioned this earlier already, learning to read and write requires the development of some complex uh, skills um, set. Um, this is a bit of a mouthful, this quotation, but I think it puts us on a, on a solid track in terms of one of the most important skill sets uh, that our children need for, for reading and, and also writing. This is from Robert Fisher's book, Teaching Children to Think. And this um, um, skill set is actually about um, focusing attention and perception. Um, one of the basic, really, really, really basic mental skill sets without which um, there is no development of so-called higher order cognitive skills. And it's obvious that reading and writing demand the development of higher order uh, cognitive skills. What Robert Fisher actually says is that our cognitive skills are organized hierarchically. 
and obviously uh, the 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 top layers of this pyramid um, uh, contains more advanced um, cognitive skills, critical thinking, um, and so on and so forth. While um, at the lower, at the basis of this of these skill sets, there is the ability to focus our attention, and it. it I think it makes total sense, um, uh, even for somebody who's not an educator, that a child who is unable to focus their attention will not be able to develop higher order skills. So what does, does Robert Fisher say here? Children need help in learning to focus perception and attention in absence of this mediation, in helping children to focus attention on single objects when they are very young, I'd like to add, can have profound effects. Perceptual skills are necessary for recognizing shapes and patterns when they're young, but also when they learn to read. They're, it's impossible to learn to read if you don't recognize and remember the shapes of the letters and the patterns letters are organized and, and how this actually uh, makes up, um, uh, uh, links up with, with sounds and creates phonics. Uh, and for comparing and differentiating objects in the environment. And of course, letters are objects too, and words are objects in our school or in our children's school environment. Children who lack effective mediation, so um, who do not learn effectively these um, uh, skills that have been mentioned here, find it hard to attend to an object, a letter, a series of letters, a word, a series of words, a series of sentences longer than it takes to register its and their existence. They lack the ability to discriminate and select. They find it hard to perform the necessary prerequisite of logical critical thinking, putting objects into mental categories. And I would like to add here, find it hard to learn to read and later learn to write. Um, this is a quotation from Lynn Cameron's excellent book on, on uh, the methodology of teaching young learners. And she says, without informed and focused in attention. So this goes in the same direction. Um, to the attention to the mechanics of reading and writing. Children may be denied access to literacy in the first and foreign languages. A great deal of focused work is needed to help children make a good start in learning to read and um, write. That's a key point. I'm just uh, looking at the chat box. I think um, we have um, a few comments here. Um, Charlene is saying, I started to learn English um, when I was three, but uh, that was through pictures and I have to trace the words. And that made me so happy. Yes, um, if I, I can imagine even at the age of three, if it's not something where children have to do too much mechanical work, but where it's nicely kind of like linked um, with the words you learn through, for, uh, through pictures and not just see as uh, um, uh, letters or letter combinations that you have to trace. Um, okay. With a lot of stimulus from digital, it's so necessary help them learning that. I'm, I'm not quite sure... Uh, what do you mean here, Marianne? Maybe you can you can actually help me um, understand. Um, certainly, if if you're aiming at that, um, digital can help uh, children too. I'm not uh, completely against supporting their learning with with digital means. If we, for example, have uh, interesting digital games um, um, uh, that help them to with with uh, letter word sentence uh, recognition and what have you um, uh, absolutely so let's talk about a few basic capabilities and how we can develop them um, through uh, reading in line with what has been said so far 
Um, so number one is, and I maintain this is important um, when it comes to the development of reading, that what comes before reading is solid uh, oral exposure to the new language. Um, yes, thank you, Katia. If you have questions, if you write them in the in the uh, Q and A box, we'll definitely take the um, uh, time um, afterwards. And I I have just looked um, uh, at what we have so far in terms of questions. Thank you. I will actually uh, come back to them uh, to them later. So um, practice matching pictures and words through multi-sensory word learning techniques and paper and pencil tasks. I think that when children are very young, it's important for them to touch. Many course books these days, including my own, have, when you look at Superminds, you have um, images and words that can be matched also online uh, through various games. That's all very, very good. But I also believe children need to be activated um, uh, multi-sensorily. So if we have also the, especially in the first few years, the, 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 the paper word cards, and if they, for example, also do their uh, paper and pencil tasks in their workbooks or, or what have you, this is of enormous help in teaching them how to um, um, uh, read just a few simple things here. Um, all my examples I've taken from from Superminds. Um, this is from the the workbook, um, and it's actually the uh, I think it's the starter book uh, where children um, have learned uh, verbs like taste and look and smell and touch and listen, and now they see various objects and they connect objects with um, those uh, lexical verbs. Of course, they have learned these words beforehand. And it's not that the teacher says to the kids, open your uh, books, look at page 18, and now match the, the words with these um, uh, uh, pictures. The children have learned this beforehand, okay? Help them grasp high-frequency sight words through flash reading of keywords, labeling of classroom objects, and furniture. I think one of you said, when I think back to the times when I learned to read and write, I, I remember um, uh, reading lots of, of labels that happens in our mother tongue, of course. Children go through the streets and they, as soon as they they... Um, uh, understand, uh, learn to read a few letters, they try and um, uh, uh, guess sometimes what these um, high-frequency sight words um, uh, mean. Uh, we can support that in the classroom, of course. Let me just uh, show you what I mean by flash reading of keywords. Now imagine... Um, after you have introduced a lexical set, which is um, the the months, um, you um, you work first of all, of course, by helping them to listen to these words. Um, you get them to repeat, maybe also with their eyes closed. Uh, if you want to do this multisensorially. I, I, I love, for example, getting them to close their eyes and I say the words in different ways. I use so-called auditory submodalities. So I whisper some words, I shout others, I sing again others. I, I, I use different moods like happy, sad, a high pitch voice, a low pitch voice, etc. Um, and I ask them to repeat the words exactly as I'm saying them. So I would say, January, February, March, April, May, etc., etc., etc. This helps with pronunciation, okay? Um, because the multi-sensory, uh, sorry, the multi, um, the auditory submodalities 
whisper, shout, high pitch, low pitch, etc., are to the ear what color underlining is to the eye. So this supports auditory memory. Okay. Then I would do uh, lip reading. So I would say, okay, look at my lips. I would just mouth the words and I would say, without actually saying the word, they guess my, my lip movements, okay? And then what often happens when you now introduce the, the written word with the help of, of word cards, um, then um, some children would actually mispronounce, okay? We want them to hear the word first very well, and then I love flash reading okay so i show them a word i say are you ready ready and they all say yes and then i go and they have to call out the words and sometimes you know i i give a teaching demonstration in the class I have 20 kids in front of me and 80 teachers are watching me. Sometimes I show the words upside down. And it's quite fascinating when children have really um, heard these words well and have spoken them, have said them several times beforehand, they can holistically also read words when they are upside down. Often what happens is that teachers who sit at the back of the class and watch me want to be helpful and give me a sign, it's upside down. And children uh, call out February. Sometimes, and this is just a game uh, for the kids, I just show the word like that. Um, so all this is flash reading and can be used um, as um, a lovely game-like activity that actually helps them to grasp and focus on high uh, frequency sight words, words they often need to see. Train them in matching letter sound combinations through first consonants and word body matching. What do I mean by that? Well, these are rhyming words, cat, mat, fat, hat, bat, rat, and chat. And now what I can do is I can cover up the um, body words um, so they um, only have the first letters, the onsets, so-called onsets. And I ask them, I point at, uh, I can't do that now, you wouldn't see me pointing at the letters. I point, for example, at the B, and they say bat, and then I point at the F. Uh, when they're very young, uh, they probably can't say B and F and, and M and CH yet. So I just um, use the, the um, phonic uh, quality. I say F, and they say fat, and I say M, and they say mat, um, uh, etc. Encourage them to predict what comes next through familiarity with chunks of language. So when you have things like, I don't like, uh, I, we've just had colors and they um, say, they learn to, to understand and then say, I don't like uh, brown, I don't like gray, I don't like black. Then you write, I don't. And then you say, what comes next? And they will call out, like and you write like and then you say what do you think comes next and then they say i don't like um, uh, green and you say oh I, I love green what do you think um what is the next word um so that it's it's right for me and then somebody says i don't like black and i say very good and i add uh black so get them to be uh, to to predict what comes next uh, <laughs> thank you for the for the flowers. Um, and I think there's a, a comment that I would like to read. Um, if they are in more contact with real life situations, 
they will have the opportunity to recognize and make relation with what they learned reading in class and what they find anywhere to read. Absolutely. I totally agree. Jilen, uh, thank you very much for the, the comment. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, um, the same for writing, the more practice. Yes, absolutely. Um, don't forget, those who write become writers. Those who wait uh, become waiters, okay? Help them notice patterns with the help of rhymes. Let me just show you. This is a poem I wrote years ago. Clarissa Whiskers is a... Somebody? Can somebody write it? Uh, the word? Cat, thank you. She eats a lot and gets quite... Car? No. Fat, absolutely. One day she starts to swim and... Run, yes, and now she's fit and has more. Lovely. You can do that also with your learners. Um, um, and then, of course, what we can do is we can um, do this. We can um, uh, change this into a skeleton text, and we can uh, ask them to remember the first line. And then I can say, can you still read it? And then we look at the next line. And I say, can you still read it? And if they can't, I go back. And then I go forth again. Um, uh, and uh, this is how I get them to, to actually learn the poem. And um, what I would encourage you to do when they're really, I, I, I haven't written up all the, the different lines, but when, when they have actually learned the poem like that, then you can start deleting individual uh, first words and it's fascinating you will notice you can in the end delete all the words then you point at where you had a letter say for example these two here q and f and they will you you have no letters there anymore you point at that and children are such good um, um, at uh, mnemonics and they remember, you have, if you've ever played uh, memory with a child, you know that. They remember what letters and what words there were. And it's great fun. And in the end, they can say the poem uh, by heart um, without uh, actually using the, the letters. Skimming and scanning through reading games. What I love doing is I, I, I say to them, um, take your, your book. So I have a copy of, of Superminds here. Put in, open it, and we're talking about a text they've already read initially. Okay. So open it. I need a text, text, text. Here we have a song. Can be song lyrics. Open it uh, to page uh, 36. Put in a pencil. Close your book. Put it in front of you. Now, when I say open it, you open it very quickly, and I'll say three words. Try to spot the three words on the page where you put in your, your pencil, okay? And I said, ready, steady, go. And then I say, wood, pond, and frog. And they go. Ch -ch 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 -ch. So it's actually um, um, uh, speed um, scanning in this uh, particular um, a case okay um, um noticing punctuation through multi-sensory games just one example here um I, I i love that activity because learners love it so much so what i do is i say to them this is not for absolute beginners okay uh, i say to them um so full stop is a hand cap comma is snipping your fingers, if they can do that already. Otherwise, it has to be, I don't know, a whistle or or um, some other sound, okay, they, they can make. Now, you start reading a little text they're already familiar with. Um, and then um, when they think there should be a comma, they actually clap their hands when they think there should be, sorry, when they think there should be a full stop, 
they clap their hands. When they think there should be a comma, they snap their fingers or the, they whistle or, or what have you. Great fun. Try it out. Um, then this is nothing new, but tracing, copying, completing are important, of course. Engage them in lots of receptive and productive, meaning-focused activities. So we have things here. This is very early. Children watch and listen, and first they only write smiley and frowny faces, draw them. Uh, but of course, what they learn to do is the symbolic, uh, they, they learn to appreciate the symbolic value of um, um abstract signs because of course the two eyes and the 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 mouth that's also an abstract sign in some ways and of course later uh, when they learn to read and write they are learning to read uh, at least um, um, colors here um uh, they need to understand the symbolic value of letters and letter combinations that's why uh, these things like ask and answer draw a smiley face or um, a frowny face that is of course reading but also a pre-step towards um, uh, writing and then meaning focused activities uh, they read the elephant is under the car and they tick yes or no the cat is on the car no. The frog is in the car? No. Uh, the spider is on the car? Yes. The duck is under the car? Duck, 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 duck? No. Okay? And then they they actually start um, um, uh, completing these sentences, so a gap text, and again, they have to look and write. I wanted to play this song to you from Superminds, but for whatever reason, we couldn't get the um, audio going so I just um, want to show you this song the frog's on a bag and that's not good put the frog in the pond yes the pond in the wood it's not um, correct the way I'm singing it but I'm singing it okay <laughs> there's a pond there's a pond there's a pond in the wood there's a pond in the wood and that's not good now um, they do a bit of um, uh, thinking. Which animals need a pond? Uh, a duck needs a pond. Which animals don't need a pond? Okay. Does a dog need a pond? Well, some kids might say yes, because dogs like swimming. Others might say no, dogs don't live in a pond. So there, this is a thinking activity where, of course, different answers are, are possible. Then... Um, we have uh, in the workbook, um, they complete the lyrics, the frogs on a bag, and that's not good. Put the frog in the pond. Yes, the pond in the wood. The ducks, and they have to check under the car, and that's not good. Put the duck on the pond. Yes, the pond in the wood, etc. And then... Um, uh, of course, we carry on doing those gap fill and completion um, um, uh, activities. Um, I'm blushing when I, I read <laughs> the nice compliments, especially uh, Catherine Salvador. Thank you so much um, about good singing. <laughs> Help them to memorize. This is a key thing, ladies and gentlemen. Help to memorize orthography through visual dictation activities. And I need to explain this a little bit. Um, in a language like Spanish, as somebody said, spelling is not a huge problem because it's enough if you write down exactly what you hear, right? In a language like English, this is much more difficult. This is why in English, we should not at least initially give our learners auditory dictations. We should not dictate by reading out words or sentences. Initially, it would actually be good to show them words like I'm doing here now. 
I say nobody's allowed to write now. Now you can write the word. What they're learning now is remember the spelling. You see what I mean? And of course, you, you, you can do that with word cards, but you can also, I don't have an example, use a paper strip with a whole sentence on it, show it to the class, leave it there for like 10, 15 seconds, the, tell the learners to remember what the words look like, remove it and ask them to write it. And later, uh, when you give them a dictation, an auditory dictation, ask them when they hear the word to remember what it actually looks like. Okay. Now um, I'm going to skip a few of these activities. Um, um, and then we're going to proper writing training. Um, uh, you know what I mean here. This is all, and these are examples from Superminds, uh, where learners, I'm sorry for the typo, learners need to become aware of who they're writing to. They need to become aware of the purpose of their writing and the topic, the content, and the message we will start, and this is from Superminds 3, with, and this is, of course, at the end of the unit where they have learned to say I or to write, I like, I don't like, um, my favorite food, uh, drink is, et cetera, et cetera. And then they learn it with our support to um, put it into a coherent short piece uh, of text or here. Um, uh, we have a text about family and the, they have learned uh, frequency uh, adverbs always, usually, sometimes, and they write a little text like, like this. These are, are texts that um, are kind of writing about my, my uh, self, uh, while what they're learning here is actually thinking about writing text messages. We, we are starting by giving them a puzzle where they are supposed to um, uh, find out the codes here with the help of the key. Then we have a list. Imagine you're in a town, write where you are at the different times. Nine o'clock, I'm at the library. They could say I'm at the toy shop, uh, 10 o'clock, etc., etc. So they write a list. And now people are writing you text messages, write their messages and your answers, okay? So they can even uh, imitate the, the text messages from here, talking about who is the sender, in this case, mom, and the time. And they can write their own little text messages. It's important also that they know that text messages usually are very short. Um, this is writing about an animal which we can combine with a bit of um, uh, research on the internet. Uh, and of course, the, the, they learn how to take notes and they write their own um, factual um, text. They're learning to write an, an advert, so, so different um, genres, which could become part of their uh, portfolio of writing. Story writing, of course, extremely important. Um, we, we start out, and this is awareness raising, by asking learners to, to read two stories. This is Amy's story A, story B, and we say which text is better and why. So um, um, they, they read the two texts, they think about why is one better um, than the other, and then um, they um, uh, improve. Um, Joel's story they write it again they make it more interesting by putting in adjectives in other words um, and then they write a story about an accident it can be a true story or a story they imagine this unit was about accidents so they have lex lexis here of course they have structures all the here, also here but we're giving them tips like adding speech to stories can make stories more interesting remember to to make uh, to use sorry inverted commas um this of course is is a um, uh, later level where we uh, talk about you know 
um, making a story uh, coherent, um, uh, uh, using different verbs of, of speech, like shout and laugh and promise, etc., etc., etc. And of course, um, the workbook needs to, uh, this was actually, I apologize, this was actually from the workbook. So the workbook needs to support this too. Ladies and gentlemen, this um, <laughs> is the end of it. I'd like to to finish off with two quotations. One comes from a, a, a real writer, um, CJ Jerry, who says it's perfectly okay to write garbage as long as you edit brilliantly. And of course, what I haven't spoken about is Process, process writing we need to help children to also learn to edit their own texts uh, these may be the topic for another um, uh, webinar one day and the other one is Jane Hyatt uh, Jolen who says exercise the writing muscle every day even if it's only a letter not not one letter letter a but a, a a letter that you write to someone, notes, a title list, a character sketch, journal entry. Sorry for the typo again here. Should be lowercase. Writers are like dancers, like athletes. Without that exercise, the muscles seize up. And that's why we actually should also help our um, kids by giving them lots of different writing tasks. Does imagination play a key role when writing or can anyone do it without it? Uh, a very good question. Thank you, uh, Daniel. I actually have given a number of webinars for Brazil on creativity and imagination with young learners. You might, uh, you will find them on the Cambridge <laughs> website. Um, somebody has their microphone. Uh, open. Um, uh, you you will find many ideas if you if you search f on YouTube. Um, it's on the Cambridge uh, in the Cambridge um, uh, video um, 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 uh, platform on the Cambridge video platform on YouTube. You will find my webinars on developing creativity with young learners, and I have various ideas there on how we can do that. At what age can we start teaching a child English as a second language in a formal way? Well, I don't know what you mean by formal. Um, I, um, I'm happy with starting at the age of three um, uh, when a child is, is relatively stable in their own language. Um, and, and formal, if you mean formal by... Um, uh, getting them to think about about things like like grammar, etc. That needs to come several years uh, later. But we can we can teach children um, uh, brilliantly when they're very young. I have written a Super Safari, a course book for very young learners. If you're inter interested, have a look. Um, a, a very good question, Catherine. Thank you. Um, when is it recommended to do uh, reading out aloud tasks and, and when uh, should we not do it? Um, a good question. I am all for number one, um, asking them to read texts out aloud that they have written themselves. So a child reads a short text like the ones I've shown you the teacher helps them correct, so the teacher edits. The child rewrites, improves the text. Then they learn to read it out aloud. And um, you help them with pronunciation. So you go to, to their um, uh, seats, to their places in the class. You help them read out um, the text. And then they stand in front of the class. And we also tell them, when we read out a text to someone, we need to have eye contact. So you need to look at your text, but you also need to look at the class. That's why it's important to read the text carefully several times beforehand. Let's not ask learners to look at the text in the book and then uh, call out several children, one after the other, to read out the same um, uh, text. Uh, Walter, first, thank you for your speech. Thank you. 
uh, students need to be literate in the first language, but what's the average age to start learning to write in English? Is there any neurological evidence to do so? Well, um, uh, there is a methodological um, 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 fact that we need to consider. Most kids in most countries around the world become literate when they are six or seven. In England, for example, many kids become literate earlier. So um, you need to, to keep this in mind. Um, I would not actually um, uh, engage students in learning to read, uh, and particularly not to write in another language before they are literate in the first language. And this is not just Herbert Puchter saying that um, all the literature I know on literacy uh, would, all the literature I know, maybe there are other people out there, but but um, this is seems um, uh, an accepted uh, position. Uh, Yeni, please, I hope you can give us an example of how to apply these strategies with multi-level classes. Well, um, <laughs> you, you, you can actually use these activities with multi-level classes. For example, when you think of, of doing, I'm, I'm just picking one now, the skeleton text, you know, when you do that with multi-level classes, you have some kids that will still need the first letters um, uh, so you can help them remember the text, while other kids will already remember the text without actually looking at the um, um, uh, skeleton text anymore. That's just one example. You can do that by actually uh, uh, differentiating the activities. I'm sorry, um, I, I would need to give a, a seminar on, on differentiation, uh, in order to be able to give a satisfying answer. Um, I very much believe that uh, differentiation is an under-acknowledged um, topic in ELT uh, methodology, and I think that um, uh, teachers need a lot more help with differentiation. Maybe in the future we can do something about this. Uh, ah, an anonymous attendee has also said, can you share some differentiation techniques to use with multi-level EFL classes in primary? I can't now. Um, this would actually uh, take too much time. But of course. I'm going to give the microphone uh, back to Katya. And I would like to thank you all very, very much for your active participation and also for your um, very kind words and for your questions in particular. Thank you. Katia, over to you. Thank you so much, Herbert, for a very inspiring and resourceful presentation. I see lots of positive comments and thank you uh, to you for the, all the ideas that you shared. We hope to, to, to have you more often in these webinars all over the world so that we can learn a lot with you. Thank you, Katia. Well, thanks very much. We will have uh, already the link in the chat box for the certificate, for the feedback form. Stay tuned, follow Cambridge on social media, especially Instagram, where we have been communicating all these webinars. Herbert, once again, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.